Uju and then we are going to do Spa Bamus in the Jenny Cars, Papua Indo Dame, Odawa is a guy, okay, Odawa is a guy, Gening and Dunjiba, Nungum Gijigat, Beji Gabid, Abiding Medeo, Minua, Miko Chu Young, Nina Kiddo for everyone coming here today. Uh, I know some of you travel a long ways and uh, some of you like to take these opportunities to travel halfway across the country to see beautiful places like this and I know it's almost vacation like while you're doing your business but uh, there's both good bad and ugly uh, to cover here cover here in this area and region because there's a lot of activity so on behalf of the board of directors of honor of the earth I welcome you for coming here we have maps for those people who uh, don't have one yet that show where we are on uh, the mapping sites and kind of an easier way to get around because we understand uh, if, you, if you understand the situation we have a 380 mile long battlefront for environmental justice going on and uh, there may be activities in on the Fond du Lac Reservation in Duluth I uh, came from Paddle on Line 5 on uh, in Mellon, Wisconsin on the Bad River yesterday uh, came from Mackinac Straits uh, a week or two ago from a large gathering of people concerned about uh, the, the straits and the tunnel that goes through there. Uh, we've got lots of lawsuits uh, going on right now and Honor the Earth is the front of many of those lawsuits. Many of those lawsuits have decisions coming down in the very near future. It's part of one of the reasons that Enbridge uh, jumped the legal process uh, while the Trump administration was still in office. Uh, they got a waiver from the environmental impact statement so that the Army Corps of Engineers didn't need to do that. And we feel that uh, the Minnesota uh, environmental impact statements are inadequate and does not adequately deal with a whole lot of issues from archaeological studies uh, to, to uh, resource studies. And uh, you can ask, we know a little bit more about some of these issues, but for example, in this area, we're at the lowest. Shell River is at its lowest level ever historically and yet Enbridge is asking to pump millions of gallons of water out of the nearby aquifers here while the farmers are watering the crops at the same time and, and the dust is blowing all over this place with pesticides and uh, the, the issue is is whether or not the unique clams here that may be endangered in this river it's a very unique clam I hope you ask questions about it because uh, I walk a lot of rivers in Wisconsin and Minnesota it's a really unique clam here it's why people have been here for 10,000 years on the road here is a 2,000 year old bound site in a village from a village that used to exist at the confluence of the Crow and the Shell. You're standing on a 300 to 800 year old village site, woodland village site associated with Sandy Lake, uh, pottery fragments from there. Uh, the extent of the villages in this area and since 1986 there's been over 240 artifacts picked up in this site. And so keep your eyes open because there's a lot of stuff to be uh, found. I found a spear point uh, the other day. It's a very old one. It's not an obsidian one, which means that it's dated back probably more 800 to 1500 years or older. It's not the shiny black and white obsidians that kind of tell you that it was more modern age stuff. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. This is an old village site, old ancient village site, a ghost town across the street from people who made buttons from the clams. There's been people here manufacturing these products for 10,000 years and you find them in burial grounds and large buttons and clasps and everything that came out of the Shell River. So a lot of activity, historic site, and uh, I believe they got across the Shell five times and the Crow once right down here within probably a couple miles of either one of our directions. So um, I could go on for another hour, but uh, that hopefully that's the basis for some additional questions. The 1855 Treaty Authority has declared this site as a historical teaching, educational, uh, traditional ecological knowledge research site in one narrative. And I can give you a copy of it. It says it makes a nice place for savage occupancy. So we're back. <laughs> and uh, we're glad that you came here with us to be with us to live and occupy and to study and to learn here on the Shaw River. Miigwech. Well, well, like What's that? That ember filing you're talking about for more permission to use more water, I think they originally asked for 510 million. I don't know that they've asked for more. We know that okay. they've asked for water and this is the historically lowest time yeah. for the shell 
We had a cap official talking to us the other day saying that people can walk into the river and grab the fish out of them because they're out of their rock enclaves and everything else. And so that uh, there are people who are walking out there with a fish hook and, and hooking them as <coughs> they're seeing them. And so uh, he was worried about the fish populations. He was worried about all the nitrates and pesticides blowing into the rivers. Uh, people, people have told us they're happy that Indians are back here acting like Indians at an old Indian village. Uh, we have one complaint so far. The complaint was filed with the Forest Service and it said that the Indians were singing loudly and erecting TVs to live in. And so if that's the worst thing that's happening down here, we uh, are going to enjoy ourselves. So I don't know if there's been modifications to that request. Do you have a request with DNR? I just want to try to keep How about, I, I can answer a little bit more questions. On Introducing Benay Sequay, yeah. Winona Ledoux. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and our attorney is on route as well, but thank you all for coming out. This is uh, the Shell River. This is uh, our camp, our traditional camp here. And this is my friend Oren, fellow water protector. Um, so as Paul explained, our people lived here for a very long time. This is our village site and you can see why. I mean, why wouldn't you want to live here and eat uh, shellfish off the Shell River? Seems like a good place to live for a very long time. And so, you know, we are, we are happy to, to come back to our territory Sadly, Embridge has also come to our territory. And so this, the Shell River is actually crossed six times by the Embridge Corporation. And I, you know, I think we have some maps to share with you all, but pipelines go straight and rivers don't. And so we're in a situation here where, you know, I am one of a number of, you know, plaintiffs and a number of organizations that for the past seven years has tried to stop this pipeline. Honor the Earth is a national native environmental organization. That was our board chair who was just here, but the White Earth Tribe, the Red Lake Tribe, the Mille Lacs Tribe, all of those Indian nations as well as environmental groups and Friends of the Headwaters have spent seven years trying to stop a, a tar sands pipeline project. As you know, this is a 915,000 barrel a day tar sands pipeline project. This is the largest tar sands pipeline project in the world and the most expensive. It's a $9 billion project that nobody wants. 95% of the people testified against this project at, the, at every hearing and for myself and for my sisters, many of whom you met yesterday at Bliss, we didn't miss a beat. We attended every hearing. We stepped in at every time we could testify. We, you know, were in every regulatory opportunity. Our people tried, we drove thousands of miles, you know, we tried to do our best to stop this pipeline. Puzzles us why the state did not. Really puzzling. The pipeline was a really bad idea seven years ago when they first proposed it. And that was when, of course, they had proposed a set five tar sands pipelines at that time because, as you may know, the cash currency of Canada is petrodollars. It's a petrostate. And the petrostate money comes out of the tar sands. The problem is, is that it's the most expensive oil in the world and the dirtiest oil in the world. And it turns out that nobody actually wants that oil anymore, including a couple of weeks ago the Saudi Sovereign Fund, as some of you have seen. Uh, divested of all his tar sands holdings after the Koch brothers and others. And, and so, you know, when the Saudis leave the oil market and buy video game stock instead, the party's probably over. And the question is, is why Minnesota would accept the liability of this pipeline? Why would that happen? And what I know is that our problem is not just our problem. You know, obviously, this little dude wants water to drink too, and I got a granddaughter just that age. You know, and by the time this guy is growing up, things are going to either go okay or not good. You know, and he didn't make this mess, we did. That's the reality, and that's why it's really important that people are here to stop this. And so they've been trying to put in all of these pipelines, and all, many of those pipeline projects have been canceled. We know that. For instance, Enbridge's first project was the Northern Gateway. They wanted to go to the Chinese markets across the Pacific. You know, nope, that one was canceled by the National Energy Board. So was, so was an Energy East pipeline. That was the longest pipeline. That was another pipeline proposed in Canada by TransCanada, changed their name, TC Energy now. And um, those guys, that pipeline was also canceled. Then the Keystone was canceled, right? So that's three of the five tar sands pipeline projects were canceled in the last couple of years. And then some of you also know that the Jordan Cove pipeline Another proposed Canadian pipeline was canceled going into Oregon and of course the Constitution pipeline. This is not a country that needs more dirty oil pipelines. And the problem is, is that we have plenty of them. Minnesota has six pipelines going across the north, a toxic corridor that Enbridge has already left us. And it's not clear how that's getting cleaned up or when they're leaving. 
That's one of the problems that we face because we just witnessed in Michigan where the governor of Michigan and the Department of Natural Resources withdrew the permits for Enbridge to operate under the Straits of Mackinac in their Line 5. They began several years of research and negotiations with Enbridge, and Enbridge decided that uh, when the permits, when the, when, the, when the state of Michigan revoked the permits and said that you have to be out, you have to close the pipeline down by May 12th, Enbridge said that the state of Michigan, which had issued the permits, didn't have the jurisdiction to revoke the permits. And so the question might be, what, <laughs> you know, the question might be, who has the jurisdiction to revoke a permit to a Canadian pipeline corporation? You know, if Michigan didn't, does the state of Minnesota have the right to revoke any permits? You know, and in Wisconsin, the Bad River Tribe also revoked their permit, noting that the pipeline had been operating for a number of years without a permit, and they sued the tribe. And so Enbridge has across the board sued any authority that has attempted to pull a permit. Now, it seems to me that somebody needs to be the adult in this situation. At what point does a Canadian pipeline corporation hold the Great Lakes hostage? and get to say that their oil gets to continue flowing and put millions of citizens, tribal and non-tribal citizens, at risk? That's really the question. And who gets to make a buck on putting in the last tar sands pipeline? Because that's what this is. We're down to two tar sands pipelines. One is, one is, one is called, I call it the Trudeau, Trudeau West. And that would be the pipeline that was formerly known as the Trans Mountain Pipeline. But of course, the Canadian government purchased that pipeline because nobody else wanted it. And they're trying to put it through. And uh, they were stopped by a hummingbird. Mm -hmm. And then there's this. This is the last tar sands pipeline. That's what I'm telling you. And it reminds me of the time when, you know, someone pointed this out to me when John Kerry, um, when John Kerry was with Vietnam Veterans Against the War. I don't know if any of you remember this moment. I'm old enough to kind of remember. But he went to Congress and testified. And he says, who is going to be the one to tell that soldier that they get to be the last one to die for a bad war? You know? That's the same question. Who gets to have the last tar sands pipeline and why? You know, we don't want it. 95% of the people in Minnesota testified against it. And here we are, standing by the river. And so what the state has done is basically grant authority to Enbridge to not only land, this is a public land giveaway. We can start with it. It's our treaty territory of the 1855 treaty. Our treaty territory is the most impacted by this pipeline. Most of the river crossings are in this territory and most of the new pipe goes right through the heart of the 1855 treaty territory. But more than that, more than a giveaway of the land to the Enbridge Corporation, they've given away the water. And that's to say that the DNR has a 630 million gallons of water that they were given, that they gave to the Enbridge Corporation to dewater and to drain out wetlands and to take waters from rivers and lakes and flush it through their lines. Interesting how you could get a permit to do such, right? And then it's a drought. Last year was the, the worst drought in Minnesota's history, known history, and this year is worse already. And we all see it. It's a national drought, right? And so this river is already two feet low. Most of our lakes are at least a foot low. And the question is, is how does Enbridge get all that water? That's a question that we might ask as prudent people who want to take care of the waters of our territory. Our territory, the 1855 Treaty Territory, and also the state of Minnesota. But more than that, this, situ this river is facing many threats. You know, our people live here for a long time because it's a good place to live, but also because of this unique clam population that lives in this river. And if you go up this river, I encourage you to take to canoe. I know most journalists don't get to do that, but you could take to canoe. You will see clams all along the river bottom of large size. They're a high quality clam, clam population, and you know what? That's a pretty risky thing to be a clam in a time of climate change, mm -hmm. right? Rivers get hot, we all know about fish kills, right? And more than that, our rice is all at risk for this, right? But add to that the fact that the Department of Natural Resources keeps allocating water permits to RDO Offit, the single largest independent potato producer in the country who grows for McDonald's. Now, I'm going to take you all on a tour after our, our treaty rights attorney has showed up. But I'm going to take you on a tour. And to the north of us, if you drove through that agricultural wasteland, what you can see is that RDO Offit has center pivot irrigation, is, is pull, pulling up hundreds of millions of gallons of water from deep underground aquifers, filling it with chemicals, and then spraying it throughout our territory. 
That is what we are looking at. You know, and that, and that is, what is what is so wrong about this, because this river is affected not only by Enbridge and the crossings, but it is also affected by industrial ag. And the thing about how, I want to say how white people think, but it's, I, I call it white people public policy. I mean, why would you not analyze the impact of all of those things on your river and your clamps? But what the regulatory process has done is they've said, no, you can't talk about that. You know, in fact, in the EIS completed by the state of Minnesota, they didn't, talk, they didn't want to talk about climate change. You know, there was a list of things we couldn't testify about. You know, and in our criticisms and challenges to the EIS, that was one of them. No climate change assessment, no treaty rights assessment. I actually think the clams need a lawyer at this point, right? I mean, that's what I'm saying is that so you have in the state, in, in our case, you have an inadequate environmental impact statement that was issued you know, by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and by the Public Utilities Commission, and you have an in inadequate certificate of need. That's to say that the certificate of need was based on projections that Enbridge made. <laughs> At what point should your dealer tell you what you need? Let me just ask you that question. You know, because that is in fact, all of the demand projections were based on Enbridge's data. And in our appeals, we pointed out, frankly, that one, 10% reduction in oil consumption, and two, this oil doesn't even go, stay in Minnesota. This is probably headed to India, you know? That's where this oil is going, it's not going to Minnesota. And so in order to meet the requirements of the certificate of need, you had to show a need in Minnesota that the need outweighed the impact of the project, it does not. But in addition to that, I see he's bored of me talking. In addition to that, um, the environmental impact statement was a state environmental impact statement entirely inadequate and there was no federal environmental impact statement. And so those are the base, that's the basis for our state court of appeals hearing. And uh, we expect a decision at the end of June. The challenges that we face are that we expect Enbridge to do what it is doing right now, which is it's going to try to get in as much pipe in the next month before the court decision comes out. Because what Enbridge wants to do is what they did with the Dakota Access Pipeline. And that would be to finish the pipe and then have the court rule that the EIS was inadequate. And we intend to stop that from happening. That's why we're here. Because there is no way that they, sh that, that they should have, they, they should complete this pipe. And people ask me what the impacts are, it's, I'll show you a little bit, but they can clear cut through here. And you know what I know, because I live here, you know, my house is about 25 miles from here. As I said, I live at the, at the headwaters of this river, is I saw, I saw bear walking over here and someone else saw bear over here. What's happening is that this is, this is the remaining biodiversity. This is where the wild things live. This is where the wild things are. And industrial ag is crushing it, as is, uh-oh, Dixie's back. Indust between industrial ag and the, and the, and the fracture, fracturing of the corridors by Enbridge, this whole ecosystem is in a really, really precarious position. And so, you know, what, what we see is that they are going recklessly ahead with this project. And before the oil, before the oil spill, before the CO2 impact of 50 new coal-fired power plants, you're going to have a lot of devastation of rivers. Come here. Come here. This is a new puppy. Okay, um, and here's our attorney who's arrived, but I don't know if you had any questions on any of this while I try to keep my dog quiet for a minute. Could you speak a little bit about Aquila Corporation? Aquila? Aquila. Uh, Aquila, sorry. Aquila Corporation? Back They're 40. part of Enbridge. Back 40. Oh, well, that's for him. Back 40, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't really know that much about it. I, you know, my experience is really just, you know, on this. And I just want to say that, I just want to say, you know, I really appreciate y'all coming here. And, you know, in my other life, I farm and I grow hemp. Do you all know this? I'm a hemp farmer. And my main interest is in this just transition. You know, this is a really bad idea. This was a bad idea seven years ago. And what Minnesota, you know, Governor Walz approved this pipeline, you know, for reasons that have baffled me and continue to baffle me as the conflict, you know, we, 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 we see a conflict worsening. We just went through the most divisive election in history. 
You know, if, as you may recall, President Trump came to uh, Bemidji. Do you all remember that? He flew into Bemidji so he could have a rally at the Bemidji airport. He didn't come to see the Indian people. He came to see the Proud Boys. That's who he came to see up here. You know, he talked about how we all had good genes. That's what he did. You know, but he wasn't talking about us. But the point is, is that this, this North is already heavily polarized. And the Indian people vote Democratic, and a lot of, there's a lot of very right-wing people up here, and there's a lot of very scared people because their neighbors scare them. And adding uh, a huge bunch of police money, which is what Enbridge has done, the escrow account, as you know, Enbridge was required by law to set up an escrow account to pay for the police after Standing Rock. Because the $38 million that it cost to repress water protectors at Standing Rock was deemed to be a little bit excessive for the state of Minnesota to absorb. So they, as a part of the contract agreement, required that a Canadian multinational finance the police in Minnesota. I find it a little problematic when foreign corporations finance your police department. And then when they come into these little towns, some of you have seen Hubbard County is, is, is not a nice place for a lot of Indian people. But you come into the town and you see Enbridge delivering equipment to the Hubbard County Sheriff. What is the equipment? Who's in charge of that? Who is in charge of all of the security detail that Enbridge has brought in to protect themselves? Who is in charge of what equipment they have? You know, we learned a lot from Tiger Swan at Standing Rock. Right? How many provocateurs have they brought in here? You know, what is their counterinsurgency plan? Pretty extensive, you know, I would suggest. But who's in charge of all, you know, keeping track of that? You know, because as, as someone who lives in the deep north, you know, I'm pretty concerned about, about what is happening and um, the rise in militarization. There is really no reason that the town of Monaga of 1,200 people should have a mine-resistant armored personnel carrier. Just after the contract was signed, both Monaga and, Hubbard and, and Park Rapids got MRAPs. You know, why does a town of 1,200 need an MRAP, right? Why did Duluth get $144,000 worth of riot equipment? Last time they had a riot was when they hung three black men in 1910. Hey, oh, oh, don't do that. But that's really fun. <laughs> anyway, uh, so are there some other questions? And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Frank give more of a legal but I appreciate people coming. Yes. So I have a question. Uh, is there any plan to work with uh, uh, financial uh, support, like banks and uh, other financial organizations, like why it was in Standing Rock, to ask them to refinance? Uh, to defund Enbridge? Yeah. Yes. I think that we need a pretty aggressive you know, c campaign. I mean, even the Minnesota Pension Fund funds it, finances Enbridge. I mean, I'm like, Let's start pulling some money in Minnesota. But, you know, I think the biggest thing is, is that, I mean, just to be honest, this, is, this was a bad economic strategy for Enbridge. You know, they, uh, you know, I've written letters to Al Monaco, the president, for five years. And I keep saying you should diversify your portfolio, you should quit, you should clean up your old pipes. You know what I'm saying is that this is a very financially risky situation. I mean, I'm just saying that, take for example the Straits of Mackinac. If you had an accident at the Straits of Mackinac, Enbridge said it was going to cost $30 million to clean it up. Then they revised it, and I think that the lowest, lowest is now, what is it, $1.6 billion? But then, but then it goes up to like $40 billion. You know, and the question I might have <laughs> is, so you gave all this to a Canadian multinational and it turns out that none of its subsidiaries are liable. You understand what I'm saying? This is the problem is that the, the mothership in Canada has the money. And so I've been around a while. I saw what Union Carbide did in Bhopal. I saw them go bankrupt. I've seen corporation after corporation go bankrupt after a major accident, leaving us to clean it up. But who's going to clean up the Great Lakes? Who is going to clean up the Great Lakes? Enbridge puts us all in huge liability, and it is really time to just say no to that corporation, and, and it is time to stop letting them tell us what to do. It's a shameful form of regulatory capture. It's really shameful what's happened to me. So, yeah. Um, when uh, I've heard from other water protectors um, that 
you know, a question from people who are for Enbridge will ask, well, don't you heat your home? Don't you drive a car? What is your response to that when people, you know, Right, I, I heard this. So the first thing you say is, you've been drinking water lately? <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty good one. It's like, you drink water? Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, that's what I tell these guys up here. You know, I mean, it's surprising. We have, there's a lot of, there's a lot of haters up here, but there's a lot of people that are 100% behind us. And they're free. You know, but the other thing I say is, look, you know, I mean, I see a guy show up here with a Tesla. I'm ready for my Tesla anytime. I mean, we all know that we're driving around in vehicles that are like 16% efficient. A combustion engine is 16% efficient. Who really wants to do that? You know, we, we want to have the 65% efficient electric vehicle, and we don't want to have to mine all of Bolivia to get the lithium. What we want is the hemp batteries that are going to come online. You know what I'm saying? Is that we, and we also just want to do a little less. I mean, you guys are from all over, but, you know, there's a pretty high level of consumption by Americans, which is excessive. I mean, we're in a situation now where what? We spend a lot of time storing our junk and money, right? You understand what I'm saying? I'm just saying is, is that people say you can't meet the, can't meet present demand with renewable energy, to which I say, why would you want to meet present demand? I mean, you're wasting 70% of your power between point of origin and point of consumption. That's what Lawrence Livermore Lab said. So why would you want to waste your power by having centralized energy protection, production and, and uh, you know, this distributed power, this power that is distributed. The other thing is that the largest energy consumer in Minnesota is Enbridge. Isn't that a baffling thought that the single largest energy consumer in the state of Minnesota is Enbridge because moving sludge takes power? And the question one might have is, why are we all powering that? Right? Yes? I'd like to hear, can you respond a little bit to Enbridge's indigenous people's policy right, that, they, in that they put up and, and all of the forwarding, all of the uh, consultations they've been doing with indigenous folks on the ground? Right. Just put a little bit of Yes, Enbridge has an indigenous people's policy, and they have been uh, trying to pretend that they are if that. You know, and so they say that they respect indigenous people's culture and rights, and that's it. But, you know, what is clear is that they do not. You know, we wouldn't be suing them, you know, if, if we, they respected us. And what Enbridge has done is that they have attempted to control tribal politics in reservations across this area. On my own reservation, their Indian whisperer, Robert Durant, ran for office while he was working for Enbridge. So they financed a run for tribal office on my reservation. They have spent hundred, over $100 million getting Indian businesses, you know, financing Indian businesses, getting Indian people to drive around their trucks at Gordon Construction, and making it look like they're pro-Indian. Well, let me ask you a question. They've been here for 50 years. I didn't see any money for 50 years. I didn't see any social service money to support community projects from Enbridge until they wanted line three. Not a cent, you know? And now what they're doing, even at Bad River, they're trying to divide our communities. They're financing divisions in our communities. And so they are an entire violation of their indigenous people's policy. And then kind of the icing on the cake. They started financing work on MMIW, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And so they're trying to like get some traction like they support it. So it's a little bit like having your predator finance your ad campaign. You know, because we didn't have the, you know, they're the guys with the guys with the sex trafficking. And they're trying to make it look like you're, they're in support of, you know, indigenous women, you know. What are they doing specifically? I know they're doing, they're supposedly they do trainings for their employees. I and mean, what is it that they're doing? She's from our village. Um, but... They're doing, um, they financed, um, well, first of all, they've been giving away a lot of things, you know, and then they've been um, financing, like, you know, so for example, the offer they gave Red Lake. So Red Lake Reservation has had an Enbridge trespass on it for 30 years. And they said, first they said, you know, I mean, it, we'll, we'll call it a surveying error by the BIA. And so just so you understand, the Bureau of Indian Affairs basically gave away these right-of-ways in the 1960s to across our reservations. You know, tribes were probably barely consulted at the time. You know, and so then um, em Enbridge has, has been, you know, coming in and, and, and trying to get, like, more involved in every facet of, of, of what, we, what we got going up here you know, in, in their little Enbridge way. But, you know, to me, what, are the, what the basics is, is like, you know, you spend um, all of this time 
in these communities. And, and th this is the deep north. <laughs> and what we need is actually a real just transition plan because all of these communities are very at risk. You know, these are communities that were largely abandoned. I mean, there are a lot of poor and low income people in the north. And, and the only jobs that have been in the north have been extraction jobs. You know, Paul Bunyan came from the north. I've been studying Paul Bunyan lately. I mean, there's like, just keep clear cutting, just keep digging holes, just keep extracting more. And we're done, we're out of things to extract. That's the problem. And so the Iron Range just lost all these jobs, right? You know, and, uh, and, and so, you know, there's all of these projects that are not gonna happen. And what we really need is, is a just transition instead of, instead of more in that. But in the case of specifically of Red Lake, sorry, I got a little bit off topic, but in this case specifically of Red Lake, Enbridge has had this trespass for a number of years. Enbridge offered, I think originally $30,000 for the trespass. The last offer, I think was about, was it 14 or 15 million? <laughs> Might've been 30 million, wow. you know, increased significantly. They're like, ah, we give you some money for your tribal college. We fund your radio station. We get you a job program where we teach you how to fix pipelines. And Red Lake said, no, we aren't gonna do it. You know, and so that's been a lot of their strategy is trying to, you know, get Indian people to look like we like pipelines. And the fact is no one actually wants a tar sands pipeline. Actually, nobody wants a tar sands pipeline. You know, and so that's what's so shameful about it. And in Canada, they've been trouting out Indian people, you know, and saying these Indians like the pipeline. And some of those people, I mean, I, I've lived for many years in a Northern Canadian village. They have very little infrastructure. You know, they have like water, water advisories. You can't drink the water in their village, but Enbridge gave them a hockey room. You know, I mean, that's what we're talking about in, in kind of the, the, the team spirit of, of, of Enbridge. And um, something, but, they're, but they've been pretty, you know, their, their policy is a sham, is what it is. So, um, does it mean that the, uh, Enbridge didn't try to um, build, like, a benefit sharing policy, like, that's uh, right. instead of social corporate responsibility? Because as I understood from your words, we are trying to pay money or giving away whatever, like talking, whatever. But was there a, any negotiations about benefit sharing, like uh, if uh, uh, reservations would be participating in, uh, well, like in the, operation and stuff like right, that? Right. The flagship of their operations is their work at Fond du Lac. And so I just want to give you like a little picture. So the Fond du Lac reservation is fighting the Polymet mine and Ambridge. Just be, you know, so our tribes are barely hanging in there in our ecosystems. Technically, the Polymet mine is probably a higher risk to the wild rice watershed of, of Fond du Lac. And so they've been fighting that project for years. And Ambridge already had six lines across their reservation. And so they're like, you know, maybe we'll just take this other line in there, you know, in this, in the, in the old route. Do we have those maps? Could someone go get the maps so that out of the, thank you, she knows where they are. Um, you know, because the original line went along Highway 2 and um, Fond du Lac took the settlement. So $225 million buys you a lot of influence. Fond du Lac has been really repressive. And just to, just to be clear on the Indigenous People's Policy, a little bit more clear. So my, uh, my lodge sister, I'm a member of our Medewan Society. You know, and uh, I pray, I do my best, you know. But I have a lodge on the banks of the Mississippi River. And I put that lodge up with Tanya Abed um, before there was a line that was posted. You know, but we were praying um, on the banks of the Mississippi River and having our ceremonies there. And I say that because technically I'm considered a Chippewa of the Mississippi. My enrollment number says I'm a Chippewa of the Mississippi. So I feel confident that I should be able to continue my life as a Chippewa of the Mississippi, right? One day I come to my lodge and there's a stake in it. And I was like, whoa. And the stake was the Embridge line because our lodge was in the middle of their easement. I didn't know that. You know, I didn't know that when we put the lodge there. I had no idea. I was praying. And so what it was clear to me is that Fond du Lac was actually in charge with Embridge of their cultural resources. And what was very clear to me is that if, if, you, if you noticed that there was a lodge there, you wouldn't put a stake in it. You might mark it off first, right? So then I'll go, I'll go back to my lodge, I'm sitting in the lodge, and then the DNR people come and say that you're trespassing, and this is on the easement. And so while I was in the lodge, they posted no trespassing around it and then charged me 
with trespassing in my own lot. Oh, wow. And so that's Enbridge's indigenous people's policy right there. You know, so the question I might have is like, my lodge is still standing. Our lodge is still standing. It's on the banks of the river. It is in the middle of the easement between two uh, drill, you know, drill paths. I don't know what they're going to do. You know, but I think that it would be, if, it, if the government of Minnesota signed the agreement, it seems like I would have some legal right to have somebody talk to me before they come in there with the bulldozer and, and bash my head in. You know, it seems like someone would talk to me. But yes. Can you talk a little bit about what your people's life would have been like here before and what your vision is for in the future without the pipelines? Yeah, I mean, two things. No, one, I mean, obviously, we're the people that live here for 10,000 years harvest wild rice from the same lake for 10,000 years, it's all good. You know, my community, this is, we start in the spring with our sugaring, and um, you know, one of our villages up here had 245,000 pounds of maple sugar in a year. You understand what I'm saying? This is rich up here. You can get sugar from this, like the maple syrup from the tree stuff, right? We have all that, you know, we have a pretty great, what would be called a subsistence harvest. We would just call it our life. This is our garden. You know, we also have great agricultural fields and gardens. I mean, I myself, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a farmer. I raise traditional corn, beans, squash varieties, tobacco, and also hemp. But, you know, my, in, in this, like our traditional life here would be, you know, you have your good village site here and, and you're doing a lot of trade with the shell wealth you have here, right? And all throughout here, all kind of good animals to eat all kind of wild rice to eat. The wild rice is up and down this river. The rice on, uh, out of Shell Lake is the longest wild rice that we uh, parch. Super interesting, like, because each wild rice variety is a little different. Shell is very long, very high quality rice. Very interesting, you know, which you only know about that. And so, you know, that would be like our old, old school way. And, and how I see, we actually have a much better plan for the future of this region. <laughs> You know, so we take care of this. Up there where there's industrial ag, that used to be prairie. You know, and that's what you need back. But to get it to prairie, what you need is hemp. Because someone has to bioremediate 40 years of off it. And someone needs to get the toxins out of the ground and someone needs to pull the carbon out of the air. And what plant, the plant that does that the fastest is hemp. And so that's what we wanna do. We'd like to see the return of a hemp economy. We call it the new green revolution with great confidence, the new Green Revolution, that's because Minnesota was the foundation of the Green Revolution with Norman Borlaug. And so it's time for the new Green Revolution and Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills in it. And we want them back. And so that's the beginning of the transition. And then the, and then the protection of these areas because, you know, our organization, Honor the Earth, has an office that is oversprayed by Offit. And I can see what is happening be, you know, from this whole region as they encroach further and further on force. And so someone needs to protect these places where the wild things are. And the 1855 Treaty Authority is who should protect that. Because the state of Minnesota has grossly mismanaged these, the, the, the wealth of our territory for the past, you know, for the past hundred years. You know, we would have some nice pine and blueberries here. That's the other thing. You know, if you go riding, so we have a horse camp there. You know, this is our traditional, our lodges for our traditional teachings. We put four young men out for fasting and they had all their traditional teachings. They were really blessed. They had, you know, good instructions, but you know, our horses up there, we ride around on there and there's all kind of blueberries. So, you know, what this should really be is blueberries, not potatoes. And I think that sounds like a very good option. Yeah. What effects of climate change are you already seeing in the future? The, the climate change is very, uh, you know, it's, um, so first of all, our wild rice crop is very uh, much in danger of, of torrential storms. That's what happens. It happens everywhere, you know. Um, that's one example of it. The other thing is what we have right now. You know, we've had no rain. There, you know, a lot of people are, plant to, are afraid to plant, you know, and they, and they see just this, you know, immense amount of, uh, of you know, this dry all around and uh, fires, fire season. We already had fires in the north, and we shouldn't have any fires yet. You know, so you can see all of those are elements of climate change that are just getting started, and the rivers are warmer. And so that's one of my biggest concerns, is that this is a really delicate population, and I saw the fish kill in the Columbia River two years ago. And you don't need another fish kill. This is You're gonna have fish kill if, these, if it gets warmer, you know, and off it takes more water out of it. 
I don't know if there's some other questions that I could definitely bring in uh, Frank. Oh, and here's our, some now. Frank, can I have Frank talk a little bit and then you can ask us both the questions. Do you want to sit? That'd be better. Okay. Come over there. Yeah, the come chair. over. Bring your chair over here. Yeah. Uh, Winona, would you just hand him the microphone? I will hand him the microphone and I'll hand him yes. this too. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look away. Well, can I just put it up on his neck? Yeah, you can just stick it on. Yeah, let me. That's fine. All right. All right. All right. Frank, could you just give me one second to test the sound? Get my battery in. Mm -hmm. I'll move closer to Frank. He's my friend. He's giving off heat. Oh, sorry. Beautiful. And, and I think we're good, Frank, so you can go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. When you started asking about climate change, you know, it's all a matter of what you're engaged in. And so I duck hunt and I also ice fish or, you know, through a spear, spearing hook. And so. I think it was maybe eight years ago now, we had a fishing opener that was set up for the governor. And normally, that's like the second weekend or whatever in May, and Lake Bemidji still had ice on it. And they had to relocate, like down to St. Cloud. Now in that same season, I also duck hunt. And we shot duck like we always did, but we went out once because we could see that the ducks that were flying weren't even mature yet because they got such a late start. So. That disruption, you don't see unless you're there. Right. So there's a lot of little things you have to be able to see. Right. So that's. Uh oh, hold that closer. No. No, I know. I'm just teasing you. So Frank, Frank's both the attorney for Honor the Earth, and he's also the White Earth Tribal Attorney on the Line Three Pipeline. And I also work with the 1855 Treaty Authority. And so we've got a couple of different things going on because, and I heard it this morning um, at the other, uh, what do we call it, Pe treaty. Treaty people's gathering. Treaty people's gathering. And treaty rights are really what's going to be the most environmental protection for what's going on. And, and I'm sorry? Mike closer. Mike closer. Or speak louder, hang Frank. it right. I'm going to hang it right here off my ear. Show it at me, Frank. Throw it at me. Yeah, they okay. Okay. This morning for the same. That's okay. No, that's okay. That's okay. I, I can hear it echoing, so it, it, that's why I probably pull it away. All right. So those, the people that were there today, it's evident to me, are very concerned about what's going on like we are with our world and our treaty rights. And I know that the people that I work with at the PUC or at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency or any of these places, they, whether they're Indian or non-Indian, they feel powerless because the state system is really what's facilitating the process. They're trying to figure out how to make it work, not how to make it stop. So that's part of the problem. Now, the other thing that happens with our treaty rights is because we have treaty rights, we've got two things that are going to happen at the same time in the probably even in the next few days. Because we have treaty rights, we have the right to be in a place. And if we have a right to be in a place, then we're not trespassing. And if we're not trespassing, you can't give us a citation for trespass and criminalize it against us. You have to give it to our off-reservation tribal court, which I'll explain in a moment. And if you're not trespassing, then how can you be a nuisance in a place you have a right to be? How can you be gathering as a group in an assembly and it be unlawful if you have rights to be there? And if you have a right to this property, whether it's hunt, fish, and gather, whether it's protecting the fish or the water or the animals, then then if you have that property, can't well, put that back here, one. Don't you have a, a right to defend property? That's what I see a lot of people do is defending their property. Heck, you can shoot people. You can shoot the burglar. You just have to be at night and not recognize them. But no, I'm just kidding. It's okay. It's okay. But so if we have a right to defend property, and we have a right to be there. People who have property have a right to have guests as well. And I can tell you, I just left a place with there's probably about 3,000 guests that are waiting to come out and visit. And that's just today. And I think, you know, that's how this is going to get solved. Because 
you know, it's it's almost like Occupy New York or Portland or whatever. You you if you don't have the power of the people, then they're going to try to make you work through the legal system. Now we've worked through the legal system, and it's worked to our advantage in the sense that what was at the beginning probably a, a one-year process, and we're now in year seven. You look at Polymet, they're like in year ten. So we're working their process, but eventually you have to make them stop. And you're going to have to make them stop in the federal court system and with the federal government, because that's who we have our treaties with. The state of Minnesota doesn't care. We're in competition for resources, and it's hard, as long as they have the police and the guns and the badges and the jails, they're going to get a lot of those resources. But if we can stand up and stop them from getting those resources or selling those resources or polluting those resources, then we've got something else going on. If we have a property right and we have a treaty, did someone think we were giving them the right to pollute? You know, that wasn't what was given. We, we understood they were going to come and live here where we lived. Those are the, they, what they told us. And we knew how we lived. You live peacefully, you live as a neighbor, you don't pollute the water. So, you know, treaty rights are still basic for us, but they're so basic that they may be the one thing that allows us to regulate our own rights by simply using our rights to travel, use, and occupy, our rights to protect monomen, our rights to travel and, and be in a place because we're not trespassing. They're very simple, low-key rights, but those are your simple civil rights that those old guys, Ben Franklin and George Washington, you know, they had Is that a pursuit of happiness? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the last little part after you read the whole thing, and it says, and the pursuit of happiness. That's us. <laughs> We're continuing the pursuit of happiness here on the river. But that's, you have to do it. And, you know, when Owen and I were young enough, no, I'm just kidding. We, but we were both over in uh, Wisconsin back in the 80s with the spearing rounds, and it was the same thing. And, and you have to be there. You have to have people helping you. And eventually what happened there was is that law enforcement, Department of Justice, the police, the sheriff's department, they understood that we had rights and they had to protect us from the white racist regnets who were drunk with ski masks on and throwing rocks and beer cans that were full at us, you know? That's what was going on. The police, and I'm talking about like 50 or 100 police with riot gear on and had the lights at night to protect us. Now, Wisconsin didn't like that and it took them a long time to recover from that, you know? We're not trying to have that, but we're back into a corner. We can't have our water, the rest of the stuff isn't going to work. You know, it's that simple. Is there a question about treaty rights or anything? Does the mic drop too low? All right. So, go ahead. I was wondering why wouldn't you uh, file a claim for the land? You know, just because as a clan or as a group or as a legitimate group. But uh, can you just file a claim? Because we have Texas. Where's that? Texas. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, first I would say Texas might, depending upon where you are, you might be subject to some of the um, prior treaties of Spain or Mexico or something like that. Right. There you go. Okay. Thank you. So <laughs> that makes us a little bit different. What I've learned from DAPL and KXL and what I'm trying to use here is actually just the opposite. I'm trying to use water rights because when they imposed public law 280 on us during termination era, one of the things they said is you can't mess with our rights to hunt, fish, and gather, and it says including water rights. And including water rights means we have water rights, it's just a matter of determining what they are. What happens with tribal court, and this is one of the possible avenues that we're going to work with, if only Minnesota and the United States and the Indians have water rights, Enbridge doesn't have water rights. Polymet doesn't have water rights. And so I'm looking at using water because people here don't have water rights. They can't say you're messing with my stuff because you're not in control. You gave it to DNR. They're polluting it. PCA will tell you we got thousands of impacted waters. So I look at the waters because it just makes more sense. People own land. People get pissed off. They think they own the land and you can't mess with their rights and it's okay. Don't mess with mine. I mean, I, I think that, you know, and 
you know, on, on one hand, you know, I think one of our deepest concerns, though, is like what this next few weeks is going to be like. You know, because we have tried to do everything. You know, and we're sitting here and, you know, you can see us and, and you know, and my family's camped down here, but, you know, and, and a lot of people have come from, from everywhere to support us. A lot of us, you know, there's old people and young people that are here. A lot of us are, you know, native people. And it's kind of the balls in Walter's court, really. You know, I mean, because in Wisconsin, what they should be doing is protecting and supporting our right, you know, to First Amendment rights or our right to continue to live in this place, you know, in peace, as we have for a long time. But instead what's happening is, is that they're, they're supporting Enbridge's right. And Enbridge is, is financing all of these police departments with this kitty so far $750,000. I'm sure it'll be up to the two million within a couple of weeks, you know, out of the kitty that they get. And so that incentivizes the repression up here. And we've seen the Hubbard County Sheriff quarreling, you know, over here trying to get people arrested. And we, we understand that the Wadita County Sheriff pointed out that people had a First Amendment right. You know, we, we've seen these sheriffs engage in more and more aggressive activities. And we've seen some of these get, you know, I mean, like Beltrami County, for instance, got $189,000, I think, from Enbridge, and they don't even have a new pipeline in their county. You know, so there's this, in, you know, the more time you spend, the more time you pull over, more times you pull over water protectors, the more times you try to issue them a ticket for parking in the public right of way, the more times you ask them. They came over here and asked us about our firewood. You know, they asked us about how many, how many campsites we had, where our firewood was from, if we had uh, tags on our canoes, and all of them have whiter tags. But I was like, so they're super concerned about our firewood, but they just gave away that right of way to this Canadian multinational. And you know, that's, that's the irony and the ridiculousness of this situation. We're gonna answer a few more questions and we'll probably relax with you for just a little bit, but then we wanted to take you on a little road trip. And I wanted to figure out how you guys organize yourselves because I want to show you the line a little bit. So I know a lot of you are here for tomorrow's exciting things that we're all going to learn what those are. Uh, but um, what I was going to say is I'm going to give you a good lay of the land. So we'll visit a little bit more here. Make sure you get your questions and then I want to get out of here so that you guys can take a look around and you could go jump in a river. Alan. What, two questions. What exactly do you expect to happen tomorrow? And the second question is what do you expect to happen the day after tomorrow and the day after that? There are many people gathered who are going to lie down. <laughs> Not all of them will stay. And you just said, you know, go back to the corner. Now. So what is your expectation? Well, I mean, a couple of things. Sadly, you know, the EPA, no one has in the Biden administration has decided to take up the fact that there's not a federal environmental impact statement on this project. Kind of a simple request, protect our rates, protect our water. The Trump administration approved this pipeline. You know, we all know that that probably was not a pipeline to approve. So the Biden administration has not elected to exercise any of its legal opportunities at the Army Corps or at the EPA or the Department of Justice thus far. You know, it would be great if they would exercise them. In our meetings with the Biden administration, we were asked, you know, we told them all the situation and at no point did we get a sense that any of those issues interested them? All they were interested in is if it was going to be like Standing Rock out here. And our point is, first of all, we actually don't want to do that. You know, if you all would just make some sense so that I don't got to get my head knocked in by Hubbard County, that'd be great. You know, can you like not get us killed for a Canadian corporation? That's our concern, is that the Biden administration and the Waltz administration have every opportunity to protect the human rights of Ojibwe people and the human rights of other people who are water protectors, and to be a water protector is not to be a criminal. Now, right over here is my friend Marianne, and she has, what do you have, like six charges? At least. At least charges. Look at that woman. You know, I mean, this is, this is <laughs> all kind of people with, water, with, with charges, you know, but they have not, they have not, you know, elected to do that. And then people say, is it going to look like Standing Rock? I said, well, look, Standing Rock was one river, just to point this out. They have 22 high direction drill crossings, and nobody likes them. And we all have canoes, and the public waters belong to the public. 
I have no idea what it's going to be looking like, but I'm encouraging the public to come to the public waters because I am t sick and tired of seeing the governments give away the public trust, you know, and the water and the commons to corporations. Oh, this morning I was at the Treaty People's Gathering. I saw you. Okay. And I could talk a little bit about the same stuff that I was talking about there, if that's what you're kind of asking. It seems like it. So, ancient rights is what sometimes is what people call what I've tried to put back together. And so, I've looked at some of the treaties. I like some of the Sioux treaties. I was out trying to help people out there at Dapple and KXL and figure out what, what had gone down and how to, how to prevent it and fix it here. And their treaties talk about their, the right to roam, use, and occupy. And, and those aren't words that we use because we're woodland and we're canoe people. So it's not like we think in those terms, but we have those terms. And even the United States looked at us that way, and they have maps that talk about that. And so when you have the rights to do that, to write, travel, use, and occupy, that is what I've defined out. That's the use of fire. Everything that they used against us, I tried to map out in rights for tribal members to displace what the state will attempt to use against us. And that's what you need to do under federal law, because ultimately we're going to end up in federal court. The people who are primarily at the gathering today are non-Indian. But what they understand is, is that we have rights. Again, we're inviting people to be here, and they're our guests. And so we understand that people have the same calling, whether or not they're indigenous or not. We all want to make sure we have clean water. And the people there today, and I, I got this odd compliment on the way out by the person at the front gate, and he said that my conversation persuaded a lot of people to go with their red shirts. And that's the ones who want to make sure they take a stand. So people need to know that their help will be watched out for. We've been in this game a long time, and I think the people who are coming, the clergy in particular, you know, they have a way of collecting money from people, and I think they've got some stuff to work with, and they're going to be out there helping us continuously. I don't think they're here just for a little while. And so I think that's going to change things. So that meeting today, if you haven't been able to look at it, that meeting today, I didn't understand it because when you're on the inside, there you go, somewhere there, is it still working? Okay, so when you're on the inside, you know, you don't see it build up. But when I left, there must have been like a mile or more of cars on the main road of 113. There was probably two, 3,000 people in there. But there were people who planned to be there, people of wealth. They have their own transportation. They have their own way to already camp. They're not asking for anything from anybody just yet. They just want to help. That is a completely different start, what we have here, than standing there. Okay, sorry about that. So by having that different start than Standing Rock, I think it's going to change all the dynamics on the ground. Winona is very friendly with the, the state park and all, you know, and that's the way to be. As an attorney, unfortunately, I know a lot of sheriffs and deputies and, you know, prosecutors and judges, but that's also helpful because that gives me normal access to see what's really going on. And that can be important because there was a, a, a young, uh, young lady that I knew. Uh, was looking at her police record, if you want to call it, that she's been charged in three places. She was charged in Fond du Lac, she was charged here in Hubbard, and she was charged up in Grand Rapids for the 30th anniversary of the largest inland oil spill. So I see that she wants to stand up. She's a white earth enroller. And so going back to the white earth part, white earth has adopted the off-reservation tribal court, and the way that they have phrased the jurisdiction for off-reservation has to do with treaty matters, it has to do with conservation and, and environment. So that goes right into our rights of unknown to protect our wild rice and our other resources. So I think we have a lot more rights that are being explained now because when you go into court, and I'll say one more thing about that, and, and it's, it's, you know, they call it red tape. I don't know why. It's white tape usually, but they also have white everything, you know, a white wash. So as an attorney and as a bureaucrat, you learn that you have to have a file and you have to have papers in that file. And they usually have to lead to a conclusion of some kind, you know. And so by having the papers that we've put together, and when you go to court, they're going to say, well, what did the Indians understand? Well, it's ri written right here. It's not guess it out, you know, state prosecutor or state conservation people. And so it's going to be a different dynamic on the ground. We are displacing their law on two or three different levels. And by using the tribal court with the Chippewa treaties, and it doesn't say Chippewa, it just talks about treaties. 
And so that could be more than the Chippewa, you know? And there's a lot of Chippewa. Our territory in the United States is probably still about 600 miles across. So when you start thinking about that, and then the other parties to some of the treaties in the beginning, the Lakota and everybody else, I think there's a lot of people who have rights that the state can't interfere with. They just needed to be described and articulated, and then maybe have a little help from the federal government. Yeah, that's, I mean, one of my, one of my concerns, uh, you know, one of my, one of my um, concerns is that the, the, the long arc of justice takes a while. I know that my attorney says that's part of why you have her lawyers. You've learned. Right, but, but the problem <laughs> is, is that, that the heavily armed police are now. <laughs> and so what I'm hoping is that people have come to stand with us, and I'm hoping that some of them will stay. Because uh, it's nice camping. There's plenty of resorts. <laughs> people come to Minnesota for vacation. Come to Minnesota for vacation. Be a water protector. Canoe. Canoe the rivers. You know, because that's what we need is people to appreciate that which is here. I mean, y'all know most people spent the last year looking at something about this big. You know what I'm saying? Get out. Get a little air. You know? Mm -hmm. See what it is. But that, so we are encouraging people to stay in, and, and we're encouraging water protector tourism. All time high. You know? Oh, yes. And speaking of which, as my friend Marianne has pointed out, we have produced a new map. This is the Minnesota tourism map. I just have to say we have produced a Minnesota tourism map with pipelines. So you can find your way around all of the pipelines in Hubbard County and in Clearwater County and Beltrami County. You can view Minnesota. You can see every water crossing is on here. I don't, have all the, I don't know if I have all the pumping stations on here probably too, but we feel that this is an important part of Minnesota tourism at this point. And the state seems to add it in with a lot of money and a lot of flip. Wondering if you have any comment about how Canadian citizens might view this and whether they can be a piece of the resolution to what's going on in the United States. I know in Alberta, Canada, it's probably difficult to talk about anti tar sands, but to the Canadian people who have refused Enbridge is route on line five through Canada because of the strong environmental laws in opposition to line five it's in the United States because it's easier to get here do Canadian people have a responsibility to address this issue yeah I mean Enbridge is the third largest corporation in Canada hey I, when I was up there when I used to fly well you guys flew but you know I used to fly too anyway I flew up there one time and they were Enbridge had proposed a new pipeline down Queens Quay and I was like, that is so funny. Like, right downtown to the waterfront in Toronto. I said, how does that feel, Toronto? <laughs> it's like they just did a multi-million dollar renovation of their waterfront, and then Enbridge said, we're putting a line in. I was like, there you go. You know, I mean, it, the Canadians, the, the Canada, <laughs> Canada needs to make a plan B. Sometimes that's called the LEAP Manifesto. That's their Green New Deal plan in Canada, and that's what they need. Because right now, all of Canada's wealth is largely based on extraction. And Canada's liability to these pipeline companies is quite big. And in our press conference that we held in, um, at the Straits of Mackinac, Canadians came down and said that they wanted their Canadian corporation to not be seen as a rogue corporation too. And a number of tribes have come out against Enbridge. There's this great campaign, um, and a number of tribes and, and British Columbia came out against Enbridge. So there's a lot of interest in this, this pro, you know, in this, in this dilemma. And I guess I just want to say, you know, it's the end of the party, Canada. We're done. Find something new to do with yourself. You know, and the fact is, is that the wind energy potential and the solar potential, I mean, as I, as I sit here in front of you, I mean, the solution to this is pretty clear. Make a just transition. That's the solution. And we're going to be fighting over rocks and pipes for the rest of our lives. They're going to have another new mining project. I mean, the Apache are fighting Rio Tinto Zinc, and we are now too. They want to open up a mine called Tamarack right in the middle of the 55. And so it's like, well, you didn't, what Walt's administration, we feel like, said to us is, you don't, you don't, you don't want the pipeline, but here's the mining for the, renewable, for the renewable energy economy. Well, I don't want that one either, you know? How about we make some just transition that makes sense? And what we all know is that Minnesota, for instance, doesn't actually make anything anymore. I don't know, the country doesn't. 
I mean, what did we all learn during the pandemic? We learned that 75% of our pharmaceuticals come from China, right? We learned that every part that you probably needed came from China. I sit there in the port of Duluth and I can watch wind turbine parts coming in from everywhere else. So, you know, we don't even make most of the things that we need for a just transition in this country. So I'd say it's time to rebuild a manufacturing sector that makes sense. You know, you could do that in Duluth. You know, we want to build a bottle washing factory in Duluth because I think, you know, destroying a single use bottle and, and the energy required to make a new bottle makes no sense when you could just wash the bottle like the rest of the world might do. That's the opportunity for new jobs. And that's the opportunity that we need the Waltz administration to step up to. Otherwise, the bitterness and the fighting is going to continue and it's just going to further polarize our community. And this summer, you know, is the summer for the rivers. You know, and so we are calling everybody out to stand with these rivers because, you know, this is the time to do it. And we need to push walls into the right frame of mind. You know, because what we don't need is endless contact. Okay, so endless conflict. So any other kind of closing up questions or then um, have, we're going to toss have you all decided? Have you all decided to speak with and work together collectively uh, with the tribes in Canada to see if you can't make uh, have pressure from Canada and from uh, Minnesota? We've done some of that, and it's broader than that. I mean, it goes into what you would call Wisconsin and Michigan and things like that. Yeah. So we, we have that kind of an alliance, but they hate they're the amount of money and the amount of poverty, it's easier to split up those those tribal people sometimes. So that threw me off from where I was thinking about going though. Oh yeah, I forgot. Many just economy transitions is part of what you were ending with. And yeah, we're all ready. We're all ready for the next economy. This yeah. is a dumb one. Yeah. Well, and the other nobody really one. needs another tar sands pipeline. That's the reality. What we need is real jobs and real water. And you know, I mean, the absurdity of this is a fifth of the world's water, and the state DNR is trashing it. They're trashing it, and we're done. You know, it's time to protect the water so we can drink it. You know. Should I give you the mic? No, we shouldn't get it. I should get it. Okay. Other questions? And we're going to be here a little bit. Awkward. And I can even stay for a minute while you're getting ready or something, but just want to make sure we answer your questions because there's going to be a different dynamic that occurs here. You're going to see Yep. You're going to see more people hang out here, I think in a different way. People who have time and people who are concerned. The clergy I've seen in other places when the things start and they're the one the last ones to go. You know, so I feel good about that. I think we're going to have good places and good camps. I think there's going to be a lot of people coming up. And I'm looking forward to seeing how it all goes. It was disappointing to see how Standing Rock went, you know. But it was out in the open. It was hot like this weekend, you know. But we're in the shade. We've got some resources. We've got places to be. We've got a lot of people that live here. And so I think it's going to work out a lot different. Yes? No? No. All right, I'm going to let one on a go. I know you guys talked for a long time. All right. Okay, so my plan is kind of this. Um, for some of you, if you're already taking a look at this map, I take this from Frank. But, okay, we are uh, on the map. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. You can see it's a really great tourism map of places you can go. This is us right here. This star on the map, right? This is Enbridge here. And so a half a mile to the left is the, is the Enbridge right-of-way, and two miles this way, and then another four miles, and then another four miles. Okay, so these are, what we're going to do is take a little cruise around here. I might show you this uh, river crossing right over here, so right over there. I can show you from Duck Lake. And then I was going to take you up through the Offutt Fields, up 71, so you can see the pipeline going into Itasca Park. Take a little road trip on that. Excellent footage areas. I might show you a couple of equipment yards so you can see the lay of the land. It's an invasion. That's what it looks like up here. I mean, in the middle of the winter, there was 4,300 out-of-state workers in the deep north. What is it called? Huh? How many 4,300, of which three quarters were out-of-state workers that came in with Enbridge and their big trucks and their bad attitudes. And they've been... They've been here, they sent them home, 
and now they brought back more. During a pandemic. During a pandemic. And so I'm going to drive, you know, I was, you know, so I think it'd be good if you guys organize yourself so that, but it doesn't matter how many cars there are, it's always a production. We can go in on public roads. That's the other thing is, is that these are public roads and we're the public. This has been like an ongoing, they try to say, you can't come in there. I'm like, public road. It's a public road. You know, and so they've been intimidating local citizens and pushing us back. And what we know is that it's a public road and someone has to be the public, you know? And that, in, in Michigan, the governor withdrew the permit based on something known as the public trust, which is an authority has the responsibility to, to have the trust of the public. In, in Minnesota, that is not the, what the governor has done. You know, and I think that someone needs to stand up for the public trust. So anyway, we're going to take you for, like, it's like, a, you know, probably about an hour and a half. You know, and you guys, I'll stop a couple places. I don't want to say you got to go to the bathroom in the woods. We'll try to accommodate that. There's a couple of odd houses here. I could take you, so this is, so just to let you know, if you don't come here this time, this is my hemp farm is here. And we have a really cool hemp farm right here. And here on our reservation, we make solar thermal panels. <laughs> so we have a solar thermal panel manufacturing facility. We have a big solar project. I would like to take some of you. You could split like maybe at Park Rackets and some who want to go with me for 35 miles over here. I could show you where we all come from. Our little village, which is full of murals and uh, solar panels and the poorest people in the state that are fighting Enbridge. So that's, the, you know, I'm here on the river, but I got a whole village. So.